Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum to everybody who's tuned into PTV World. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning into our Ramazan special transmission, which goes with the name of Ramazan Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, I happen to be Shahzad Hassan Khan, and with me I have my very learned, very knowledgeable colleague, and she happens to be Miss Hajra Sati. Hello, Hajra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you doing today? Walaikum assalam. I'm good and thank you so much. I'm again humbled by your introduction. You know, I'm always humbled by your but introduction. But you truly deserve it, to be very honest. And I thank believe that this is something which everybody needs to do, rather with their colleagues or with their family members as well. And you know what, in relation to that, I have right. one more thing to say and that is, and I have said it repeatedly, uh, may it be on television, may it be on any other show I am hosting or I am attending or I am a guest. And what I do is that I would always refer to that one example because one day what happened, so you know, I walked into a room, there were a couple of people sitting over there and one would be like, hey, you know what, sir, your tie looks very nice. The other one was like, hey, your shoes look very nice. The other one was like, hey, you know what, the suit you're wearing looks very nice. And I was like, hey, why can't you just tell me that I look nice? <laughs> and this is something which I would want to kind of uh, contemplate on as well. And I want people to please make sure that you make this a habit that if you're complimenting somebody, for example, if you are to compliment me about my waistcoat, Rather say, hey, you know what, this waistcoat looks good on you. You know, rather than saying, your waistcoat is very good. You know, I think that's better and makes the other person's day as well. And you really need to be honest with that. And in addition to that, God forbid, if, you know, somebody is trying to flatter or probably is trying to kind of give me that feeling that, hey, you know what, for example, if somebody um, kind of has some sort of business with me, you right. know, they would probably try to make me happy, you know. So you would always know the difference in between flattery and in between where the person is actually right. being authentic and it's truly a compliment as well. What do you have to say about right. that? Right, Shazad, I think that our culture values, you know, uh, and dignifies the, the values of reservedness, right? So I would be very, you know, uh, reserved and shy if I have to compliment, especially the opposite gender like that. But if I'm saying that you're wearing a nice waistcoat, it means I'm complime yeah, yeah. complimenting you because, you know, you have good aesthetic sense, that means. All right, thank you very right? much for saying that. that you know because otherwise I would have never understood that you were <laughs> complimenting my aesthetic <laughs> sense as well and one yeah. more thing since yeah. you know you were very honest uh, with your reply where you said that you know the replying to the opposite gender or probably complimenting them right. you know would make you feel shy right. you know I have this question so alhamdulillah I've always made sure to have this habit ladies and gentlemen that whoever I come across I will always say the salam first you know may it be yes. the opposite gender or may it be the same gender as well but what I have realized is that even for example if I'm going to my gym and if there's a lady coming out of the lift you know I would say my salam but they would never reply because you know, so for example if somebody whom you do not know at all right. is right in front of you and they say salam would you would you say your salam I, I would say walaikum salam but in a very you know <laughs> low tone in a very reserved tone you know so the message would get across that <laughs> even, you know, yeah, a, even I, I get through that as well you know because a lot of times this is something which I hear because you never know the intention of you know other person it's a good thing that you know you need I mean, to do salam how can we judge intentions you, you, you know, you never know, you know, what the other person, because I, I as I said, you know, that That's our true. culture uh, respect the feeling of reservedness. And I do feel that it has, you know, some dignity uh, to that, you know, if you feel reserved. True. So uh, it's Ramazan, Shahzad, yes. and of course, it's a month where Holy Quran was revealed. Um, and, you know, every time I read this book, you know, it is so amazing that every time I get a new message, you know, that reverberates across me, that rejuvenates me, also, you know, shakes me to the core. Um, and uh, having said that, you know, I would like to share a quote uh, about this book, which was written by Raza Eslan, sure. who um, happens to write a book, No God But God, like, you know, which is said in the Kalama, La ilaha illallah, Allah. right? So he said that as a text, Quran is more than a foundation of Islamic religion. It is a source of Arabic grammar. It is Arabic, what Homer is to Greek, what Chaucer is to English, a snapshot of an evolving lang language frozen forever in the time. You know? and, and do you think there can be any other poet better than Allah Almighty himself? Of course, and, of course. and to be very honest, ladies and gentlemen, that's how the book, uh, the Holy Book Quran is. And right. to be very honest, we certainly would love to talk about Ramazan and Quran in right. our first segment. But before we do that, I have a very important question. Because so I make sure that, you know, I eat healthy, I work out and I exercise and I kind of, you know, shared that with everybody, that everybody needs to kind of do that. 
So it is very imperative. It is very. It is of pivotal importance that yeah. we kind of know what we really need to eat in in Sahur. Uh, and it's because of the fact that a lot of times we do have a lot of parathas, chapatis, right. keema, right. and you know all sorts of curry and whatever is left from the yesterday's aftar. We like okay, you know, right. just pour right. it in, and that's going to be all right. And what you do not realize is that in the middle of the day, you might just start feeling very thirsty just because of the fact that the type of food you have right. consumed. So what do you utilize, or probably what do you consume? at sahur time right so i go with the paratha <laughs> all time favorite of pakistanis yeah. and then i go with the cheese omelet cheese omelet and wow. then i drink two glass of water but i think these rozas are not that hard you know as compared to the rozas of june and july right True. so um, uh, i it think it works yes it works and it gives me energy and it gives me you know satisfied paratha will always give you yes, energy i yes. mean this and is something and happiness too <laughs> <laughs> i think i think this is something which right. every each and every one of us has right. realized and even my trainer used to tell right. me that hey sir please make sure that you avoid paratha and I was like yaar if you want me to lift weights i can only do it right. after i eat paratha you know i think that is just the mindset so but ladies and gentlemen for healthy sahur or for healthy healthy sari uh uh very so, uh, sorry for the healthy sahur what we really need to do is that we really need to uh, eat healthy which makes sure that we ensuring that our health is going to be our top priority as well but how can we do that is something uh, which we are going to share with you please go ahead and check it out uh, what you really need to eat in sahri let's go Ramadan is the holiest month in the entire year according to Islamic tradition. In this scorching heat, it's imperative to eat the right foods during Ramadan, especially at the time of Sehri. Sehri is a meal consumed every morning before the Fajr prayers. Eating the right foods for Sehri ensures that you are hydrated and nourished and also gives you the energy to go without food during the day. According to nutritionists, Sehri is extremely important especially when you are without food and water for about 12 hours. Not only should you include fluids in your diet but also foods that keep you hydrated throughout the day. Here are a few reasons why you must not skip Sehri and tips to keep your energy levels up throughout the day. Set the table for Sehri yourself. Many people don't feel hungry early in the morning. If you feel the same way, set the table for Sehri yourself as it may help stimulate hunger. Consume fiber-rich and high-carb foods. Don't stuff yourself just because you have to stay hungry the whole day. Instead, have fiber-rich and high-carb foods that will help you stay full throughout the day. Don't consume caffeinated drinks. Try not to consume caffeinated drinks like tea or coffee. Consume fruits. Fruits can help overcome the constant feeling of thirst throughout the day and keep you hydrated. So uh, now you've seen a very interesting, you know, package on the how you know you need to keep your rosas and on the nutrition value of the uh, Ramadan. So uh, as we were talking about Quran and Ramazan, and now we have a very esteemed guest with us, you know, has been uh, since the start of the Ramazan, you know, telling us about the importance of uh, Quran and the importance of Islam, uh, and that happens to be Imran Sandhu Sab. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and thank you so much for again coming to our show. Absolutely perfect, and sir, today obviously we picked up on a very important topic, and we said. Certainly want to share your knowledge with our viewers as well. Right. We're not saying or referring to <laughs> us as very knowledgeable as well. Right. And but before we do that, sir, obviously we certainly want to start our day uh, today uh, with uh, Nathay Kalam as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, for that we're very lucky that we've been joined by Mr. Ali Haruni. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. How are you? Absolutely perfect. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Sir. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for joining us. So, what are you going to share with us? Uh, एक नातिर सलीम मकबूज है फेमस नजीर आर्टिस्ट सैयद रबीद मसूद शादी आप पेश करते हैं आप मैं पेश करता हूँ मदीने से बुलावा आ रहा है मदीने से बुलावा आ रहा है मदीने से बुलावा रहा है मदीने से बुलावा रहा है मेरा
जा दिल मुझसे पहले जा रहा है मेरा दिल मुझसे पहले जा रहा है और ये चक्की सैया की चल रही है ये चक्की सैया की चल रही है जमाना जितना लंगर खा रहा है जमाना जितना लंगर खा रहा है मदीने से बोलावा आ रहा है और नवासों का वो सदका बाटते हैं नवासों का वो सदका बाटते हैं और जमाना उनका सदका खा रहा है जमाना उनका सदका खा रहा है मदीने से बोलावा आ रहा है यहाँ मर्जी नहीं चलती किसी की यहाँ मर्जी नहीं चलती किसी ती मदीने वाला ही बुलवा रहा है मदीने वाला ही बुलवा रहा है मदीने से बुलावा आ रहा है जहाँ मर्जी नहीं चलती किसी की मदीने वाला ही बुला रहा है सुबह अल्लाह थैंक यू वेरी मच यू नो इट वाज इट वाज वेरी सरियल टू लिसन टू uh such an amazing nath ali uh, in the morning as well and to be very honest you know thank you very much ali haruni for for sharing it with us as well and obviously you know it kind of purifies your soul whenever you listen to That's nath and the sole reason why i've said that is that in the first place i think it's always the holy book quran whenever we read it it is to purify your soul and it is to kind of have that connection with allah almighty mm-hmm. which is why i want to move on to imran sandu sahab over here so now sandu sahab you know the most understood fact about the holy uh, book quran is and most of the times i've heard people say it even hajjah sati sahiba said it you know just at the beginning of the program and that is that whenever whatever kind of thought process you are in <coughs> and if you're going to read quran you will always have a very different interpretation of what's happening or what should happen you know so that's how it is do you think that this notion about the holy book quran is absolutely or 100% correct or not or do you think that quran always gives out the same message every time nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallim ala rasulih al-karim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alif lam mim zalika al-kitab la rayba fihi hudal lil-muttaqin keeping in view uh, the the topic today this is a relevant question that what do you get out of quran what do you understand from quran uh, when you read it and Uh, so allah says it's hidaya zalik al kitab la rayba fihi hudal lil muttaqin and hidaya for whom who are muttaqi and we have already discussed taqwa and muttaqi uh, the the meaning of taqwa 
taqwa is not somebody who has got a special you know get up rather taqwa is something relative to uh, your intentions when you read quran or conscience of allah which this is something which we discussed right. in the previous yeah, episode the god consciousness yes. so uh, taqwa now the relationship between ramadan and quran is also very relevant so in 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 quran itself allah, allah subhanahu wa taala says that uh, kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun so one common factor between uh, and it kind of relates to what uh, uh, satti saiba said that uh, uh, you you understand different notions or different angles of quran every time you read it True. so and allah's messenger said that sometimes is uh, quran's one aya is never actually negating the other aya it is the situation that actually uh, correlates over here when the situation changes quran gives you the hidayah from the same aya in a different perspective fa'tabiru ya ulil absar as it is said in quran o people of knowledge uh, <coughs> or o, o people of vision be relative in your thinking so the relativity of the situation correlates with the relevant relativity of your understanding of the situation and this is how quran gives you hidayah as well and some of the ayahs of quran actually does tafsir of the other ayahs as well as i said that zalik al kitab la rahiba fihi hudal lil muttaqin it is it is uh, guidance for the muttaqi Uh, and uh, and on the other side allah subhanahu wa taala says that kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun so taqwa is the common factor of uh, of saum or uh, fasting and ramadan the, the 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 destiny is the same or the result is the same that if we according to quran if we if we keep fast we are going to have taqwa and uh, and according to quran if we read quran we will get hidayah if we are muttaqi so so this month of ramadan is a month of taqwa and this book quran is for muttaqin right wonderful uh, so um, imran santu sahab you know it is said that you should think you belong to truth but you should not think that the truth belongs to you so what is the difference between the two is it linked to the quran well uh, always philosophical hajra <laughs> 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 uh, so a truth belongs to you and you don't belong to truth, to truth yeah so i think uh, what she means is uh, there is a difference between reality and truth so so you belong to truth like uh, you belong to reality we've got our realities right and and all realities are not or all, all truth is may not be reality but all realities would always be true this this is this is how we can interpret what hajra said um <clears throat> meaning uh what uh, what you want to what you want to perceive and you think it is true you can say you can say that it is true that i believe it true but it is not it is not uh possible that what you believe is true rather um, uh, or it's true to believe something but the reality of that thing may not be right exactly or, or probably i think that the context probably might be uh, you know and i will stand corrected if you want to correct me as well and that is that you know that you are the you are the reality and for whatever you kind of think about might not be the reality i think i think that's what it is that is it like for example if a person denies the existence of god nauzubillah right 
it is true that he is denied, uh, denying the uh, uh, existence of but God. That's not the reality. Now. But that's not the reality. True. Which is why, you know, in addition true. to that, you know, and adding on to how Misaj is always very philosophical. <laughs> and so, sir, there's this one body organ uh, uh, which is always very important, particularly in our religion as well. And as right. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has spoken about it. That if that one organ in your body is on the right path, you know, everything's going to be right. God forbid it's not then no, nothing's going to be right as well. So imagine that, you know, when we talk about Quran in the first place, they say that Dilon Ka Sakoon is in Quran. And I've always read about it, you know, the Quran talks about it as well. But how do you think that, you know, for, one, for all of those individuals who are out there, for all of those people who are watching us today, our Ramazan Pakistan transmission, how do you think we kind of, you know, absorb this information within our own hearts and then kind of make our heart at peace or calm as well because I do listen to Quran almost alhamdulillah every single day I try reciting it whenever I get the opportunity as well but what is that kind of sukoon we are talking about I think that's something which I'm still looking for or I'm still searching for as well even though I know that my heart is at a good place <laughs> alhamdulillah but how do you think that reciting Quran or reading Quran will actually help you have that peace of heart uh, definitely it uh, it tells you the purpose of life and when you uh, when you are close to the purpose of life or when you are in 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 the quest of your destiny or your destiny, ultimate reality uh, as you say you know <coughs> the ultimate reality the, uh, the subject the object and the ultimate reality quran uh, the, the 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 subject of quran is Hidayah, and whenever you get guidance uh, about anything, about the way you want to go, even if you if you are on a road and you don't know where where you need uh, you, you you want to reach out to some place and you don't know the way to that place, you ask someone and he'll tell you you go on right and left and you're going to reach that place. You're going to get uh, some kind of a relief. tranquility relief, yeah. right? So. Quran in the same way is guidance and whenever you are going to get guidance in real terms and this book actually starts with the word la raib like with, it, it, it eradicates all kind of doubts in your you know in your heart the, this is the attribute of Quran and when you come out of your doubts you get you you, you, you feel uh, tranquility and iman it, and when it creates iman, iman is followed up by tranqu tranquility. So this is why you, wh whenever you are going to read Quran, you are going to uh, s f see your destiny. You are going to be, uh, you are go there are questions and you are, you know, uh, questions are going to be answered. Exactly. And so thank you very much for saying that because, you know, uh, we have done a lot of shows together as well. And you know that my questions are multi-tiered <laughs> as, <laughs> as well. And which is why I wanted this answer from you as well. Because what happens is that, you know, so uh, within our own education system or the way we have studied Quran, I think now that I've all grown up, I think that, you know, we haven't done it the right way. You know, so there was obviously a Qari who would always come to my place. We would read Quran in Arabic. And, you know, obviously, certainly I do not understand Arabic at that point of time mm -hmm. as well. So I couldn't really comprehend that whatever I read. And I'm, I'm totally against this kind of Quran education as well. And it's because of the fact that each and every one of us who's reading Quran really needs to make sure that they understand the meaning of it as well. Because otherwise, what's the point of reading? Okay, sawab, yes, that Allah has promised us that we will get. But what's the point of reading a book if you cannot understand it at all? How do you think we change that system where each and every one of us can understand rather than just asking somebody, sir, so you know, there's a lot of confusion then there's a lot of vibration in your heart and then your heart is not at peace and it's just because of the fact that you were reading it but you never knew what you were reading. So, uh, if you remember that ayah of Quran, وَبْعَصْفِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ There are four purposes of sending a messenger uh, according to this dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, yatlu alayhi ma yatihi wa yuallimuhumul kitab wal hikma wa yuzakim. Four purpose. 
four, the job description is four folds. The first objective of sending is the Quran is Tilawa. Tilawa is something like for example, when you read Alif Lam Meem, do you know the meaning of Alif Lam Meem? Nobody knows the meaning of Alif Lam Meem. So, there is a, there, there is a message over here and you, you, you got, you get actually sawab of reading Alif Lam Meem, though you don't know, understand, you do not understand the meaning of Alif Lam Meem. And thank you very much for saying that, I would want you to continue, but you know, I just remember and it just popped up in my mind as well that I once asked my Karisa, what is Alif Lam Meem and you know what he said? Bitte, it's just Alif Lam Meem, so just read Alif Lam Meem. I was like, okay, Alif so, Lam Meem. So, in one sense, Allah gives you, Allah is giving you a message that Alif Lam Meem, only I know the meaning of Alif Lam Meem, you don't know, but because I have sent it, just read it. Just read it. And make your, the starting point, make your uh, intellect go under this book. Try to, try to learn from this book. This is the message, right? So, Tilawa, this is the first thing. So, we, we should actually say that reading the book, even without understanding is, beneficial. The second, the, then the second stage comes when you have started to uh, understand and recite the book and normally the age children are going to uh, re start reciting the book, they are not intellectually as vibrant, uh, as strong as a 40 year old or 25 year old person would be. True. So, you know the age of uh, you know, learning the recitation is from uh, Four to se seven years to maybe eleven years, okay. and then uh, you know slowly but steadily uh, the children become adults, and in this process they they start uh, uh, to develop their intellect. Now, this 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 is where the second stage com comes. Tali kitab means you have to understand the meaning of the book. And then, till the age of 25, do you have you are starting to develop intellect, and at the age of uh, 40, you start become mature, yeah. intellectually very mature. Then, well, hikma. Then comes the hikma, the wisdom behind the book, and then you become practical. Uh, you, you become authoritative in the sense you you start getting authorities in the world. Then Quran also makes the skin up, nafs, and you start implementing this book the into your house, into the, the, the society. So you are right in a sense that Quran is not has not has not merely come only for reading, but reading is one of the objectives of coming of Quran as well. Mm -hmm. Because unless or until you start reading, you won't understand the meaning of the book. And when you start understanding the meaning of the book, you will start understanding the wisdom behind the book. Yes. And when you have start, and when all these three things uh, come come forth, come into your heart, you start becoming uh, uh, you know experienced and uh, practical uh, practicing that book. That is you uh, use a him. Wow, right, wonderful right. and. To be very honest, I think that's what that this is something for everybody out there as well. That it's a it's a book which is going to give you that code of conduct. And you know, once right. you start to practice that code of conduct, ladies and gentlemen, everything is going to be at peace. And this is for each and every one of us to understand. And I think Ramadan is also <coughs> the the month of not only listening to Quran, uh, recitation of Quran. True. Uh, we even read Tiravis in Quran. Even this Quran was revealed from the, f uh, the uh, from Lohe Mahfuz to the first heaven, just in one night, and then sl slowly revealed. Uh, and and which is why, sir, you know, towards the end, for uh, for me to understand, I hope that you know a lot of my viewers would already know this as well. But since you are here, I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity. Why Allah chose uh, Ramadan uh, for the Quran to be revealed upon Prophet Muhammad? It is not Allah. only Quran that was uh, chosen to be revealed in, in, in Ramadan. All right. Rather, all the other books. Why even? And the interesting thing is, do you know what is the difference between Quran and the other books? What? So, other books, you know, Qur Quran has an additional attribute. The other books, according to Ahadith, 
uh, were Azim. also revealed in uh, in Ramadan, and they were they the status of those books are Kitabullah. They were all Kitabullah, but Quran is has an additional attribute. It is Kalamullah as well. Kalamullah. The yeah. other books were revealed to their messengers, but the 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 tabir or the 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 words were the interpretations of the the, the prophets. It was like a hadith Wonderful. The status of those books were a hadith, and this is Karamullah and Mahfuz. Quran is also Mahfuz from from uh, getting eradicated from this world so right. th because it is kalamullah so we yeah. are we are lucky to have quran with thank you very much for saying that but don't you think <coughs> that you know that quran or, or all of the other holy books were actually revealed in the month of ramadan means that you know that we uh, that you know when we give importance to fasting and when we give importance to the holy month of ramadan so that we connect with Quran as well. Do you think that can be the reason why Quran was revealed in the holy month of Ramadan? Yeah, and that is why that is why I say that we revi revise whole of the Quran, and this is a Sunnah. Even uh, Jibreel al -Salam, used to come to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the month of Ramadan, and he used to revise uh, from Surah Fatiha to uh, uh, you know, and in the last year of his life, uh, before uh, ascending to. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, it was revised twice to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Ramadan. Wow, wonderful. Thank you very much, Sandhu Sahab, for being with us. Thank you very much, Ali, uh, for being with us. Lovely to be in conversation and for each and everybody who's out there, ladies and gentlemen, every single day, our motto over here is to make sure that we have a deeper understanding of our religion yeah. and for all of those people who are out there, you know, because it's always good to kind of understand all of those other religions which do exist simultaneously as well and then it's totally your choice but to be very honest i think i feel proud i feel blessed that i am uh, from uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam and that he will be representing us all of all of the moments and muslims uh, you know on the day of judgment as well so please make sure that you make the right decision with that we're actually heading out towards a short break when we come back we will actually be in conversation with somebody who understand who understood drones very well as well so we will be talking about that let's do that and how drones can actually help us uh, improve our agriculture sector and how we can contribute to our economy with the help of drones ladies and gentlemen don't go anywhere we'll be right back ramazan pakistan is life book is hope and book is light for the future first 10 days of ramadan are to seek mercy oh Forgive and have mercy, and you are the best of merciful. Sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. He who does not respect the elders, does not have mercy on children, does not commend what is good, and does not forbid what is evil is not one of us.
and welcome back. Uh, now, so Shahzad, I think that you should always, you know, grasp wisdom wherever you find it, from mm. whatever place you find it. Uh, and as uh, Shahzad uh, talked about, that we're going to be in conversation with someone, you know, who's working on a very different aspect of, you know, drones. And he happens to be Mr. Inamullah Khan, who's also a researcher at King's College London. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and thank you so much for joining us. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity over here to speak in front of the people uh, about drones, specifically about the agriculture industry. Right, in a very constructive yeah, way. Exactly, and it's likewise. But, Sagi Pira Khairam, Barabar, Jode Tagre. Fine. Wonderful. So let's uh, uh, get Start. started with the conversation. You know, obviously, this is for the very first time that we will be talking about how drones can contribute to the agriculture and healthcare as well. And but before too. we do that, but before we do that, I think what we really need to establish over here is right. that for a country where majority of its economy was dependent, was dependent on agriculture, we haven't really increased our per uh, acre yield, you know, and we were unable to do that because there was no mm. uh, intervention or the technological intervention which has taken place right. in the last five de decades or six decades or whatever we might probably want to refer to, that will be honest. And to be very honest, we're still on a tractor, we're still figuring it out whether the front wheels are bigger or the rear wheels are bigger. How do you think you out, out of the blue had this idea that, hey, you know what, drones can actually help us with agriculture and healthcare. With healthcare, we've seen there are surveillance ambulances coming in as well, but how agriculture? And that too with a mini drone. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, I will say, but the thing is, uh, drones are contributing in uh, lots of industries, True. I will say. Uh, as far as my research and my findings are concerned, mm -hmm. so I will say about that drones are everywhere, not even in agriculture, not even in a medical field, it's everywhere. everywhere. Delivery. So, yeah. Taxis. And and I, and I will say that drones are life-saving mm -hmm. nowadays as well, as you earlier discussed about that drones are in the healthcare industry as well. So uh, moving towards the agriculture industry, uh, uh, as uh, Israel has like modernized the smart farming, uh, industrial farming and like each and everything they have modernized quite well using internet of things, using internet of uh, medical things I will say. So uh, as far as the things are concerned, each and every knowledge is uh, integrated with it. Uh, if I talk about the drip farming they have introduced, uh, it is giving us a very good uh, things uh, in, in, a, in a plantation, in the yielding, uh, in uh, increasing the uh, agriculture uh, farming, I will say. So uh, drip farming can be introduced using uh, drones and it will smarten the life of the farmers as well and uh, as far as if i talk about the uh, concerns uh, regarding pakistani farmers so i think we have to educate them properly because if uh, the things are coming spe specifically about the modern technology so we should aware them we should give them awareness about the new and modern yeah. technology because uh, i will say that the modern uh, things are coming uh, everywhere around the world even in the third world countries as well even our government has uh, given some bold step towards that uh, specifically i will uh, talk about the punjab uh, it board they have uh, they are doing quite well about that so the things are uh, that we have to educate the farmers and that industry as well thank you very much for saying that because i believe that it's not just for the farmers to be educated i think it's for the law enforcing agencies as well you fly a drone over here in islamabad all of a sudden you see two cops coming Chasing you, hey, why are you uh, flying a drone over here? It's a sensitive area. You go somewhere else to fly a drone, all of a sudden there will be more people that be like, hey, you know what, this is a no-fly zone, you cannot fly a drone. How do you think that we educate all of those people within those police stations who merely might know what we are using this technology for and will always be there to hinder so that we do not progress? Because all of that sort of hindrances has always made sure that we are never going to progress as well. Unfortunately, there's this... Uh, other gentlemen, and I've seen his video on YouTube, who make helicopters at his home and in the backyard of his home right, as well. Right. He flew a helicopter and all of a sudden he was jailed just because of the fact, oh, you didn't have any permission. And that's not for any nation to kind of grow because we're not giving them the opportunity. People experiment. We do not have research labs away. We do not have facilities. People want to do their own research and they're not allowed because... Those people within the law enforcing agencies do not have any idea about what we are doing and they would rather label it as a threat to that very particular place as well. How do we do that? Because we need to educate them in the first place. And how do you think that we will benefit 
from drones on this sort of technology in terms of agriculture and healthcare? Uh, let me uh, say something about the, uh, like the, mindset. As we, yeah, mindset as well. And I will say that uh, as the things are modernizing, so uh, I will specifically talk about the licensing thing because if someone is making something, so he or she must have been uh, having a specific license for that. If he is not aware of a licensing thing, like uh, if he is making drones, if he is making uh, so so what what are our government agencies uh, uh, doing over there? See, so I basically over here because mm -hmm. I think that the licensing should come in when we start to produce it uh, for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, rather when you are in the experimental phase, you know it's so hard for me to kind of chip in money from my own pocket mm -hmm. to make a helicopter work you know mm -hmm. why why do you think i should bother about going to somebody's office and be like sir please mujhe ijazat de de main helicopter banana chahta hu see it does not work like this because we haven't been that part of pakistan in particular has never been a part of industrial revolution as well you know mm -hmm. to be very honest and you mm -hmm. know with information and technology we might jump onto the bandwagon but it has never happened so people have no idea about how progressive people or people who are innovators might think because you know for me if i am innovating somebody rather than going to somebody and asking for permission i'd be like yaar kar lo and then we will think about it you know mm -hmm. so for the first the product needs to come and then we'll talk about it as well so we really need to educate those people but i think i'm drifting away from the topic as of now but let's talk about how drones can actually help us in agriculture and healthcare uh i will uh, i will sure, must sure. answer that sure. because like uh, the main thing uh, behind everything is research research True. and research True. and we can only do that through uh, educating people and our youth uh, by by giving a very good uh, like uh, uh, opportunities uh, in universities especially uh, as you told earlier that we are having lack of resources and the things i was also having the uh, the the same uh, problem but uh, i did worked uh, in these sort of a conditions as well yeah. and i made one of the uh, routing protocol specifically for the i did study that about that but i couldn't understand <laughs> what that was yeah, because the, the the scientific names and the things are quite di right. difficult to pronounce so but it was a e and hocknet uh, yeah. protocol that w i was ma i have made uh, in 2020 yeah. uh the like how we are communicating with each other uh using some specific language so yeah. the drones are also having some specific languages <sighs> so i made that algorithm and i made that protocol to that drones can also communicate with each other wow. so uh, if we deploy the same thing over there in agriculture industry so it will modernize uh, the decision making purposes mm -hmm. like uh, if we are doing some decision regarding plants if they are having uh, like uh, a flooding of uh, water over there so there will be a problem so if the right uh, information will comes to the base station or the right person on time so he can Take do right whatever you time uh, uh, what he wants so i will say that drones can modernize agriculture industry and i will say that uh, as uh, the dripping uh, irrigation uh israel has implemented that so we have to implement that uh using drones True. uh drones are the best i will say that uh, it can save life it can be the best part of the uh, uh in the agriculture industry as well so i think uh we have to do lots of research regarding that and we have to uh, um, like educate our youth uh, specifically about the innovative technologies as technology. well so, so that the farmers can actually afford to have drones as well i think we need to work on that because we really need cheaper solutions we want the same technology right. or but we want yeah, yeah we want subsidized rather i would want you know because you know i have I, uh, while i was on my way back from us i actually bought a drone which was this mini as well and it, it used to do backflips as well it only costed me 30 dollars so okay. imagine you know if we kind of start to work on that and there is there are facilities over in islamabad there is a university who are actually researching on it and making their own drones as well all we need to do is that we really need to come into mass production so that we achieve economies of scale as well and that everybody can utilize it right that's true and uh, that's a very interesting conversation that we are having right over now uh, so what is the initial response you know um that the thing that you're proposing especially using the drones for the agriculture uh, have you talked to the farm is it is in that state have you talked to the farmers about uh, it we try it out 
uh, basically I'm on my way developing algorithms and like that. So I call myself a cognitive algorithm <laughs> developer uh, oh. because drones are having many applications and the right. things. So uh, when you make a technology, when you make an algorithm, uh, you just deploy it over there on a drone and drone can be everywhere as I said earlier. So we can use it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and as far as the technological things are concerned, so uh, uh, as the things are moving towards the web technologies. So also I will talk that each and everything must have the uh, like the cyber security, security as yeah. well. So drones also need that things as well. And yeah. uh, one of my uh, thing uh, book I will mention uh, recently, which is published in Springer, uh, Switzerland. And I talk specifically uh, about the intrusion detection system regarding drones, yes. uh, which can identify uh, how the attack is coming on the drone, how mm -hmm. the things are. So you can like do whatever you want with the drone. All right. Thank right. you very much for it's saying that. But let us, you know, make sure that you know that this technology is going to be safe for each and every one of us, right. because you certainly did write about you know that those threats which the drones can be under. So the type of algorithms you are uh, making as of now for your drones to work, do you think those algorithms will prompt you about any cyber security threat? Uh, yeah, uh, I will say that. Uh, Did that ever happen so far? Uh, lots of uh, cyber threats can happen. Even uh, someone can uh, take out your mobile data. Someone can take out uh, lots of like because uh, the coming uh, future warfare will be just on the data. information yeah, and yeah, data. Yeah. I will mm -hmm. say. So that is the you, money. Yeah. So I will say that if you are going to save yourself, save your uh, mobile phone, save your laptop. So uh, cyber threats are everywhere. Phishing pages were, was very common and each and everything was very common. So uh, as the things are modernizing, I will say that we must have to secure them as well. So security is the best part in drones as well. Exactly. Uh, uh, if we are having some high official in a hospital, I will say, and if you are going to have a, a very firm surveillance over there and uh, someone is going to give them any poison or like that, so drone can give you the right and, and accurate don't. information on right time. Uh, I will say drones, as I'm saying, drones are everywhere. So yep. drones can also be used there in the uh, uh, cricket as well. <laughs> we are already <laughs> using it. No. Uh, if uh, Yeah, we are using in the cricket as well, specifically for filming or like that. Yeah. Uh, I want that drone can be used as a referee as well. <laughs> but I think the drone really needs to come in with a speaker and we can do that. Mm -hmm. But we would certainly, it's possible. But it's we possible. would certainly wa want Aleem Dar Sahib or Asan Raza Sahib to be on the pitch as well. You know, <laughs> let's not take the jobs away as well. But yes, that's true. You know, that this is very much possible as well. But for people to kind of talk about, I think in COVID times we have, uh, developed our trust more onto drones as well where pizza deliveries are taking place in Dubai people are traveling from right. drone taxis from one place to another and it's very convenient as well I hope we figure out a way that how we really need to kind of have cheaper solutions for agriculture so that we can build our economy once again you know partially on agriculture as well because majority right. of the land over here ladies and gentlemen uh, supports agriculture and we really need to kind of produce let's uh, let's feed the world well thank you very much for joining us it was wonderful to be thank in you. conversation with you uh, do you want to say something uh, Sati? no I would just wrap it up and say that like just uh, Shazad mentioned that you know we have a really negative connotations with the drones attack here uh, in our country and I hope that we're able to use this technology in a more constructive manner right mm. and we have a person who is talking about it you know utilizing it in a uh, more healthier manner uh, that's it for now so um, uh, it's the first, uh, first usher of the Ramazan and on Monday we will be right back. Exactly. So ladies and gentlemen, please look after yourselves and we hope and pray that you're not going to eat too much, uh, you know, once you start to open your iftar as well. So thank you very much for staying tuned. Uh, Ramazan Pakistan's team signing off. Allah Hafiz, look after yourself. Ramazan Pakistan, Ramazan.